it's the middle of a farm question, and uh, I promise to tell you about peanut butter. <laughs> the uh, this this is an article in Newsweek, uh, early 1981, when the big peanut butter shortage hit. The uh, the headline was the peanut butter crunch. That's typical. <laughs> Now, a lot, listen, a lot of people get paid a lot of money for thinking of headlines like this. So. <laughs> um, anyway, what happened was that there was a big drought in 1980, a summer peanut crop, which is mostly in Georgia, of course, and, and, this, and other parts of the South. Uh, the peanut crop was cut by 45%. Shh, buy it. And the peanut crop went down by 45%, which is, of course, you know, pretty drastic, uh, as, you can, as you can see. And uh, so this, of course, means that, again, with price on the y-axis, quantity on the x-axis, all of a sudden, you have a huge fall uh, and a big a tendency, you know, a big increase in price. <clears throat> of course, the... Uh, <clears throat> In addition, in addition to that, the supply had been cut anyway by marketing orders, by 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 acreage controls, all the rest of it. In other words, this was a this is a big increase from the, from the free free market price, with huge amount of, uh, of 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 cartelizing by the government and price supports keeping it up there and all the rest of it. So it always had been very high price to begin with. All of a sudden, you have this big drop in, in production. Um, the um, Prices in the grocery store went up by 75%, even doubling. In other words, quantity went down by 45%, and retail prices went up from 75% to 100. So, of course, this stimulated immediate hoarding of peanut butter. If you see the prices going up, you try to grab it before it goes up even further. <coughs> um, the um, wholesale prices for top quality peanuts, which had been 1979. Um, Four hundred and fifty-five dollars a ton by nineteen eighty. I mean, one year later uh, was fifteen hundred and ten dollars a ton. So that's almost tripling, more than tripling, of the price of top quality peanuts. Of course, there's different grades of peanuts, and actually, the top quality ones are the were the scarcest. <clears throat> so the big uh, losses for peanut farmers, uh, big unemployment, um, peanut crops, that sort of thing. <clears throat> So to, to keep the price up, there had been, in addition to before this hit, there had been rigid, not only big price control, not only big uh, production controls and acreage controls, but of course big import quotas, because a lot of foreign countries produce peanuts. And uh, so, for example, there's a rigid maximum import quota, and um, of 102 million pounds of peanuts, and um, which is really almost nothing. I don't know what the total production is. It's like 10 times that amount. We, so, um, so after many months of frantic pressure by the Peanut Butter and Nut Processors Association, namely Skippy and all these other people who are GIF, I don't, I'm not really a peanut butter eater, so I, I, I'm not familiar with all the brands. But at any rate, uh, after many months of, of you know, saying, Jesus, we can't get any peanuts and the prices double and triple and all that, like the U.S. Department of Agriculture finally agreed to, to let in 200 million pounds of peanuts, but only temporarily and only for a, for a few months. Uh, not, of course, permanently. So the whole thing was too little and too late to try to so alleviate the peanut crisis. <clears throat> um, the, uh, so what you have in, in the peanut, peanut business, you have a small plot, you've got to say, acreage control and production control. So you can't, maximum acreage of 1.6 million acres. Uh, marketing every every farmer, every individual farmer has a maximum quota. You can't produce more than X amount of pounds of peanuts, and it's rigidly enforced. And you can do that, I guess, in the peanut business because it's fairly concentrated in Georgia. It's not like all over the country, like wheat with wheat is or, or tomatoes or something like that. So as a result of all this, we've got um, very tight restriction of supply, and then on top of that, as I say, came the, the drought, fa the, the the crop failure. <clears throat> Um, so, um, so they finally allow next season, uh, for example, there's a, there's a maximum growing allotment, acreage allotment. The regular one was 1.685 million acres. In other words, this was the maximum amount of acreage 
and no other acres could go under to become peanut. Because the usual thing is, if you have a big peanut failure, the next year they grow more peanuts, and, you know, in response to the increased price, there'd be an increase in supply a year or two from then on. Couldn't, couldn't do that because it was illegal. It was illegal to <clears throat> grow more than this amount, <clears throat> this number of acres. So finally, the Department of Agriculture graciously allowed to have to increase it to 1.7 million, a big deal. That was their big concession. 100 and, what is it, 135,000 increase of acres. <clears throat> Even that <clears throat> was done after a lot of pressure and a lot of hysteria on the part of the peanut users. So, and the marketing quotas went up by 5%. The amount, the production quotas went up by 5%. The acreage quota went up by almost nothing. I mean, how did, whatever you can see yourself, less than 1% uh, increase. So, in other words, even after this big scarcity, increased scarcity, shortage, and all the rest of it, and tripling of the price, it still was were very, very reluctant to even have a temporary increase in acreage or in, or in production. <clears throat> There's also a big cheese thing, which uh, I used to know more about, but there's, there's a big, there, there are very strong farm price supports for butter and cheese. There's an enormous amount of cheese which is stored in warehouses all over the country, millions of pounds, unused. Uh, just there. Nobody uses them. They can't sell them because it'll just lower the price. So all these things, <clears throat> so there are vast uh, distortions and economic distortions of resources. For the benefit of a few farmers, a few large farmers and warehouse men and, uh, and the Department of Agriculture bureaucracy. That's about it. The rest of us have to sweat, uh, sweat for it. <clears throat> uh, I mentioned payment in kind. <clears throat> the PIC program, which is Reagan administration's contribution to all this, namely that the but they you can unload, there's a way of unloading some surpluses. You unload wheat surpluses or cotton surpluses. If the farmers agree to cut their acreage in half and you give them free their surplus, and then they can sell it. So this is another, another crazy uh, setup which simply makes the thing worse. <clears throat> it then cuts production further. Um, the, um, <clears throat> here's a, just a, a, state, a concluding article on PIC. Uh, which is the conclusion of the article, which says, excluding some short-run gains to farm labor and farm operators, large landowners and U.S. Department of Agriculture personnel are the major recipients of pick largesse. Landowners will gain because the supply of land is relatively inelastic. Consequently, a 1% increase in returns to a unit of farm land will be matched by a 1% increase in the market price of such land. Thus, land values will rise more than without pick. Um, of course, the major winners are the USDA personnel, which requires administrative staff and more employment for agriculture bureau bureaucrats. <coughs> anyway, the farmers, as I mentioned last time, the farmers are now are wailing again because they went into the heavy debt uh, when the, during the boom period, speculating on large increase, permanent increases in their land value. And now when the price fell, uh, since the recession came, of course, this means that they're, they have to pay heavy debt with a lower price farm, farm product. And again, they're being bailed out by the American U.S. government, by, by bankers, which bail out the banks, which in turn bail out the farmers. There's an no, enormous amount of wailing about this. Um, <clears throat> okay, that's, the, that's the basic farm question. There are still some crops which are not under control, I think. I think vegetable crops are very difficult to control. They're all over the place. Tomatoes and lettuce, things like that, are, are relatively free market. The rest of the, most of the rest of the crops are in uh, miserable shape and, get, and getting worse with a network of competing subsidies, controls, restrictions, and all the rest of it. Okay, that's basically the farm question. My prediction is we'll not get better as time goes on. There's no, there's no political group seems to be willing to, to bite, bite the bullet on this and say, let's, you know, let's eliminate all this stuff and uh, go over to free market. <coughs> um, here we now come to the, to the next major example of... Uh, Minimum price control. Yeah. 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 Right. Uh, I don't see how that's exactly the same, uh, unless in terms of being of bidding up the land prices, or the inflation of the, uh, uh, be something. Yeah, yeah, land. Yeah, um, as land gets, in other words, as land gets, let's put it this way, as land gets subsidized, 
the price of the land gets more valuable, like tobacco land. It's a beautiful example of the everybody has the right <clears throat> you have to have the government right to grow tobacco in your land. So the right is worth a lot. Right can be sold like a taxi medallion. So as the right gets worth more, it costs you a lot to buy into it. You're, this is, by the way, happens in general. Monopoly returns. This is an example of monopoly return. The right to grow tobacco is worth a lot, say $4,000 an acre or something. The new guy buying tobacco land from an old guy is only who wants to sell out. The new guy then is <clears throat> pays so much that he doesn't get, gain anything from the monopoly price. He has to, because he has to, his gains are absorbed in the price he has to pay to the old, the old landowner. It's very much like the taxi medallion. See, what happens with taxi medallion, did I mention taxi medallion last time? Yeah. What happens with taxi medallions is the first guy who gets taxi licenses, and we'll get back to this later when we get to monopoly, but taxi licenses used to cost 10 bucks. You know, you go down, like most other licenses, you go down, you go to the tax bureau or the motor vehicle bureau, you get your, you get a taxi like you prove you can drive a car and you're good whatever, a good driver and stuff, and you get, and you buy your car and you get a taxi and then you, you get a tax, uh, uh, um, taxi license for $10. <clears throat> uh, there were, in, in the 1920s, there were approximately 25,000 cabs on the streets of New York. Then during the Depression, uh, all businesses were in bad shape. Also, in the Depression, not too many people ride cabs, and it's a, sort of a luxury item, so they, this fell off quite a bit. So by 1937, <clears throat> there were 11,747 cabs on the streets of New York. <clears throat> so the taxi industry goes to the mayor at the time and says, we, we, need, we need temporary emergency help. Watch out, by the way, for any, any case of temporary emergency, emergency help. It usually becomes very soon a permanent part of the American heritage. It can never be gotten rid of. So in this case, they said, okay, we won't issue any more licenses for a while. And this has continued. From 1937 to 1986, until this day, there are no, there's a severe limit of 11,747 cabs in the streets of New York, period. And, the, and this is symbolized by the yellow color and the, the light on top, and also the medallion, which is the shield, uh, which, is the, which is the license. <clears throat> so that means you can't get anything, you can't go down to the hack bureau or whatever and get you pay your 10 bucks, because there's no, no new license has been issued for 50 years. So if you want to buy a license to drive a cab, then you have to, you have to, Buy it from somebody else who's willing to sell it, willing to retire or get out of the business. And the price of this has fluctuated. It's like a market price in, in monopoly, monopoly licenses. During the 30s, nothing much happened because of the Depression. Then came World War II. A lot of people left, etc. After the war, it starts a big boom, as, of course, there's an the increase in the demand curves of inflation with a general recovery and so forth. And so the price starts to go up, price of medallions. And it's right now 100, 000, over $100,000 in the last... When I first started talking about this in the 60s when I came here, it was about 50,000, 40,000. It's now going up to about 100,000. So this means that to own a cab in New York, you have to have, you have, not only have to be a good driver, not only have to buy a car, but you also have to shell out 100,000 bucks. So this means that you have to either go heavily into debt or whatever, so that you, the price is going way up. So, so another thing this means is this, that the rate of return, this is true of most monopoly industries. This gets back to your question on, on insurance, et cetera, because mon most monopoly industries wind up not getting, not doing very well. I mean, there's an initially big boost to the industry to the, for the subsidy of the monopoly or something. It's like the farmers. They, for a long time, they're in great shape. But then you see the, their costs get bid up. In this case, the, the cost of the medallion. So the people, so now you have to, in other words, now you have, when you invest in, in, a, in a cab, you have to get, you have to, your rate of return, let's say you're making $10,000 a year, you now have to consider not only what your investment in general, but the $100,000 you have to shell out. So the rate of return falls is pretty no, no greater than anybody else. The monopoly profits that you get from the, the licenses have been absorbed, has been absorbed by the 100000 bucks you have to shell out. <clears throat> the result of that is the taxi, driver, the taxi owners now are not, not making any more money than any other industry. They, and, yet they, and they feel they're not. They're always talking about how they're oppressed, they can't make out, etc. And the reason for that is they have to, the money has to shell out to, to buy the damn license to begin with. So <clears throat> the people really benefited were the original guys, the guys who got the license, the existing people in 1937 who hung on for a few years, and then when the price went up, so loud. Essentially, they, 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 they got a monopoly gain of $10 for 100000 or whatever it was. In other words, they get the benefit. The people who buy in later <clears throat> get washed out. <clears throat> on the other hand, even though they're not making any monopoly benefits now, they fight like tigers to keep all of it because... If there's free entry into the taxi business, they lose the whole hundred thousand bucks. They just get wiped out because from then on, we can just go and get a, a ten bucks and get a license. So even though they're not, there's no extra benefit anymore. They fight like tigers, like like, like ferociously to keep the 
to keep the lights and not, not allow any expansion from the 11,747. As a result of that, everybody loses and nobody really gains by this whole rotten system. The consumers lose because we're, we're paying, we've restricted entry, which would have been, let's say, over here. Restricted entry at a much higher price. <clears throat> and, uh, and the taxi people don't even gain. And, the, and the, other people lose. The people who would have been taxi owners if they had only allowed free entry. They like to be taxi owners and can't do it. Have to be taxi employees, let's say. And can't own their cab because of the, they have to show out $100,000. So it's a, it's a system which nobody benefits. And yet, the people who hold on who have the license now will fight like tigers to keep it. So as I said last time, I think when Mayor Koch, it's a pretty ingenious plan to get around the taxi lobby, which is very powerful, especially since the absolute boss of the box democracy, Stanley Friedman, is the, is the taxi owner's lobbyist <coughs> in New York. To get around it, Koch offered to give each every taxi owner one free medallion. Just give it to them free, which is like giving everybody $100,000, provided they use it or, or somebody else uses it. They sell it to somebody who will use it within a year. So in other words, Doubling the supply to 22,000, which we can certainly absorb since I mean, it's a real scandal to see that we have half the number, less than half the number of cabs than they had in the 1920s. Uh, for the much bigger population in Boom, boom Town and the rest of it. Um, sure, they would double the amount, so the price of, the, of each medallion would fall, but still, in all, they pick up, you know, they have free medallions. They were too scared to do it, too afraid of any, any, any relaxation of this, of this rotten uh, system. Uh, to accept it, and then they fought against it, and they defeated it. Koch had to withdraw, even Koch, as powerful as he is politically, had to withdraw the suggestion. <clears throat> so what they've built, built up over the years, of course, is a series of illegal cabs, now quasi-illegal. The whole structure of cabs, because of the shortage now, because of the shortage imposed by fantastic scarcity, means the cab, cab owners or cab drivers, like you know, with any other con price controls, maximum price controls, they're in the driver's seat on prohibition. Uh, so that's why the cab driver somewhat, somewhat knows it everybody. When, when it's slight, and when it starts drizzling a little bit, all of a sudden the off-duty signs go on. Right? No, can't, can't get any cab. Where you can't go to, you can't go to Brooklyn if you're in Manhattan. You can't go to the Bronx. You can't go to Northern Manhattan. You can't go anywhere. No, we're sorry, we're uh, we're going we're going into the, to the garage. Right? That's the famous uh, excuse. So they they ruling the roost. And as a matter of fact, somebody said in order to go from Manhattan to Brooklyn, you have to stand on the curb waving a dollar bill. <laughs> <laughs> as a symbol, not not that as a symbol of what they're going to yeah, symbol of what they're going to uh, shell out of these guys and black market payments, <laughs> illegal payments in this state. So the cab drivers in the roof, and of course, if it, as I say, if it rains, snows, if it's rush hour, you can't find anybody. So if they're free, if it's a free entry in the cab business, why should you? Why should why should a cab only be a full time cab? Why should it only be yellow? Why shouldn't you be able to take a car out and in rush hours in the rain, nip into the situation, starting to you know, pick up some extra change by Ferrying people around. Obviously, uh, that's what would happen in a free entry situation. <clears throat> so the result was this, the, the, the growing up of the so-called gypsy cab business, uh, which is, uh, originally were illegal. <clears throat> and uh, and the, 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 the organized taxi official medallion drivers are very bitter about that. They used to beat up the gypsy cab drivers and stuff like that. They finally a, a, a achieved an arrangement a few years ago where the gypsy cab drivers became quasi-legal, became legalized. And the arrangement was that the gypsies could, well, they couldn't, they could, I think, they can cruise around it, <clears throat> basically in Brooklyn and, and the Queens and mostly, and Bronx are mostly gypsy. It's sort of legal there. And in Manhattan, they could, they can't cruise, they can't pick up people that can be called up, which you can't, they can't, allegedly can't pick up people on the street. Of course, in practice, they do it, but that's, I mean, it's, you know, it's the, the frown on. They, also, the only reason why the, the official taxi people finally allow this is they don't, they can't cut the price. In other words, it's a metered price. The price is regulated by the government, city government. As long as the gypsies can't cut price, the, the non-gypsies don't mind too much. The price becoming a key thing, as long as you can fix this amount. Uh, then there are also, of course, gyp gypsy gypsies who are, who do cut price, much more informally, sort of, you know, you can't tell them, it doesn't say taxi on the outside and all sort of thing. So all this is a result of this, of this nonsense of, uh, the taxi monopoly. <coughs> um, the, uh, the many, some wing of economists claim what we should do is to compensate the taxi, just pay them off in order to be able to have a free uh, free entry in the taxi business. But you can see the Koch plan was something like that, and they, and it, they, they wouldn't do it. They refused to go along with it. And then the same process works uh, with the tobacco farmers, with, with oil import quotas in the days when there were such, and with economics of slavery, which is very interesting economically. Um, under slavery, the... Uh, the um, the slave master gets, in other words, if this is the, 
we'll get to marginal product later, but wages tend to equal the worker's marginal product. So if the marginal product, let's say, is twenty thousand dollars a year, and subsistence is say eight thousand, under slavery, the slave master pays off the pays the, the slave only has subsistence and enough to reproduce and so forth, and then pockets the rest of the money, the other twelve thousand. You think that the slave master is getting a huge profit rate? In practice, however, they really don't. So they have to buy slaves, and the purchase of the slave, the price of the slaves absorbs, just much like the medallion, the monopoly the slave profits. So you wind up, <clears throat> after you know some decades of this, you wind up with a slave master not making any more money than any other business, and yet fighting like hell to keep slavery because then they lose their investment on the slave, they lose their capital investment, and so the slave master of course fought to, to the end to keep it, even though they weren't getting an extra profit out of it. So oh, it's a bizarre system. It's, it's, it's very similar, even though it's obviously the content is different from the from the Daniel license, taxi licenses. Okay, so that's the uh, anyway. I've got, that's that's again a similar system of, of how the market uh, absorbs monopoly uh, prices and monopoly returns in different uh, different forms. If the if the return is attached to the asset, like a slave or a, or a monopoly li or a medallion. <coughs> uh, so anyway, so you wind up if you have a, you have a monopoly subsidy, let's say to railroads. First, they're making heavy profits. Then, after a while, the cost of the railroads go up, the land costs go up, and you wind up with a rate of return no no bigger. As a matter of fact, usually lower because they're inefficient by this time. They haven't been able to meet competition, and they, they start going bankrupt. This is basically what happened to the airlines. The airlines were heavily subsidized. Competition was kept out. Their rates were pushed up, but then they got so inefficient, and the, and the salaries of the pilots and them. Stewards and stuff went up so much, they started losing money anyway. I mean, they went along with deregulation. They figured that it's not going to be worse than this. So in the long run, the monopolists don't really benefit. But of course, in the long run, it takes a long time. And you know, all sorts of problems in the meantime. Okay, so that's the farm question. <clears throat> uh, if anybody, any other questions on the farm? As a matter of fact, we'll have questions on the farm as a whole. So certainly Tuesday, maybe maybe today, some the end of the time. So we now get to the next, the other major case of minimum price control, which is minimum wage laws uh, in the labor market. <clears throat> Here we have the wage rates and uh, quantity. This is in this case, quantity of factors hired. In other words, quantity of labor hired or labor hours. And um, supply of workers and demand curve for labor. This then becomes, of course, different workers will get different wage rates in accordance with their productivity, as we'll see later on. But the point is, this, this, the whole labor market is interrelated. <clears throat> but the minimum wage law says uh, no one shall be paid below a certain rate. It's illegal. <clears throat> it's an example of minimum price control. Illegal to pay something less than whatever it is. I think it's, what's it now? Three twenty-five an hour or something? Huh? Three thirty-five an hour. All right. It keeps going up. Uh, so it's illegal to make less than, <clears throat> or to pay something less than that. So what, again, what happens is you're, you're pushing the wage rate above the free market level. This means that at this rate, the demand for labor will be less than the supply of labor, and that means there's unsold surplus, in this case, of workers. In other words, unemployment, what we call unemployment. Uh, unsold surplus of labor is known as unemployment. <clears throat> And the unemployment will be the unemployment will be permanent since the unless there's a black market, of course, which there is. Unless there's a black market which push, pushes the wage rates down to the market clearing uh, level where supply and demand are equal, where there's no, where there's full employment. In other words, uh, anybody who wants to work at that wage will get a job. If you push the wage rate above that, you wind up with permanent <coughs> unemployment or permanent uh, unsold surplus of labor. And the higher the rate compared to the free market level, the more the worse the unemployment. And uh, <clears throat> it's exactly the same principles as the as the farm price support program. So nobody buys labor and laborers and stores them. They just remain unemployed. Fortunately, they don't store them. Under slavery, I guess they, they would store them, <clears throat> put them in a warehouse. <laughs> At any rate, so this is the uh, again. This is part of the. This is you see. This is, directly follows from the uh, from keeping the wage, wage rate above the free market level. Now, in many cases, there are black market uh, black markets in labor. Uh, for example, undocumented aliens or illegal aliens don't obviously don't well, they work off the books as cool. The whole, by the way, in New York, there's a whole tradition of working off the books. Uh, 
It means you don't have to worry about minimum wage law. You don't have to worry about Social Security tax. So both the employer and the employee benefits. You don't have to make out the forms and all the rest of the junk. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, as an income, you don't have to make out the income taxes on a basis. So as, as I say, a whole, this is only really done to be done with small businesses. Well, big businesses are in the public eye. I mean, IBM can't do it because they're constantly under inspection. But a small business can nip in and out of the market, can do it. One of the advantages of working for a small firm, a mom and pop firm, as it's called. Uh, so, uh, and of course, those who receive tips, uh, waitresses and things, people like that, and waiters and waitresses uh, are often don't report the tips, and so they, they get, uh, you know, they, they get essentially get, get around in minimum wage law that way. Uh, although the, the IRS is trying to crack down on, on waiters and waitresses now, have, have Gestapo inspection, <laughs> flying squads to inspect. Yeah, right. <laughs> so, uh, now this. Uh, now the proponents of minimum wage law, they always say that there's no relationship. This is all nonsense. There's no relationship between minimum wage law and unemployment. <clears throat> and the interesting thing is if this is really true, okay, if it's really true that, that a minimum wage law only helps the so-called marginal worker. And notice, by the way, who is unemployed by this. It's the marginal workers. It's those who, are, who would be getting between $2 and $3.35 an hour or whatever. It's not the high-paid workers. They don't suffer from this. It's the low-paid workers, the ones who are precise, supposed to be helped by a minimum wage law, these are the very people who are screwed by it. Interesting situation here. The, the, the skilled mason or skilled carpenter is getting $10 an hour or whatever, $20 an hour. He's not being, he doesn't, doesn't care about math. He benefits, as we'll see, because his competition is being shoved out of the market. It's the people who are the lower-paid workers who would have been getting this who are now disemployed by the system. Um, the proponents of the minimum wage law claim it has no effect. It's all ridiculous. The minimum wage law does not cause any unemployment whatsoever. If this were really true, why do they stop at 335 an hour? Why are they pikers, the advocates, the AFL-CIO, and the other liberals who advocate minimum wage? Why, why, you know, what's, if it's really true it has no ill effects, why not go for broke here? I mean, why stop at 335 an hour or a dollar? Yeah, $10, $100 an hour, $1,000 an hour, why not? Yeah. What's the permanent minimum wage? It's the law. And the government passes the law, either state or federal. Huh? Well, that's, that's the point I'm getting to. You know, how do they, how do they come up with it? What I'm trying to say is, if they, they simply said, okay, let's let's benefit everybody, let's make it a minimum wage of a thousand dollars an hour or something like that, the result would be 99.9 percent .9 unemployment. We'd all be unemployed, right? In other words, you can manufacture as much unemployment as you want by simply jacking up the minimum wage law. <clears throat> if at Poly they, they they pass the minimum wage law, say if they said nobody can get less than a million dollars a year, we'd all of course be unemployed. The whole gang here. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so the question, uh, you, you asked a very good question uh, in the back of the room there. What determines, how do they decide where to put it? Well, it seems to me they decide where to put it. The way they do it is they disemploy just the people they don't like. They raise it enough to disemploy competitors they don't like, marginal workers. In other words, those who are getting on the marginal level, okay, who are generally non-union or no seniority in unions, who are usually blacks and teenagers, blacks, women, and teenagers, who usually come on the marginal Area. Uh, the people they don't they don't push it up high enough, however, to, however, disemploy to disemploy union workers with white union workers with seniority. They never push it up to fifty dollars an hour, a thousand dollars an hour, because that would disemploy everybody. They make it the AFL CIO makes it usually the main lobbyist for this, make it so that it's the people they don't like will get shafted, and they're the ones who are competing, the marginal workers are competing with the higher skilled workers, or the workers with seniority. So there's a method to the madness here, is what I'm saying. It's not random. It's not an accident. They only, they only make the, the, the minimum wage high enough to disemploy the people they don't really care about. They never push it so high, they really start disemploying union workers of seniority and mine workers and teamsters and all that sort of stuff. Yeah? Right. Well, it goes up for inflation, so you keep pushing it up. Yeah, but it's been, it was, it was $1.60 now, not too long ago, about 20 years ago. But it keeps it keeps increasing. <laughs> yeah, right. That's right. Absolutely. That's exactly what happens. And then I have some figures on this for you for that minute. But the, what happens? Unemployment starts decreasing because the, as inflation proceeds, the minimum wage becomes less and less important. Uh, and then they jack it up again to make sure that the same <laughs> the unemployment level goes up again. It's, it's amazing. Um, so that's one, so as I said, this is, uh, it can't be an action. This is exactly where the AFL CIO people put it. If you argue with these people, if you argue with AFL CIO economists or 
left-wing left liberal economists, they'll, they'll finally admit it. They'll say they're honest enough, and they won't admit it before Congress or something. But they'll admit it. Yes, yes, they'll say it's better for these people not to be employed in low-paying low, low jobs. better for them to be on welfare and be employed on low-paying jobs. It's an interesting statement because it's, they're not making a decision up to the individual worker. They're making a decision for them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. Precisely, it's the teenagers always have a, almost always have a lower productivity, as we'll see later, than, than adult workers. They haven't got the experience. So, so entry level, as it's called, workers, teenagers usually start with lower, lower uh, um, wage rates than adults. Okay. Uh, so they lop it off. They make it in such a way that this employs a lot of teenagers. And then the only thing which would help the teenagers is to cut the wage to the minimum wage law. That's a very sensible. I would favor getting rid of the whole thing, but it's a very sensible first step. And they fight like heck against it because they don't want teenagers, teenagers competing with adult workers. In other words, you're getting rid of the competition. As we'll see when we get to the labor market later on in the course, uh, the whole labor law system is a system by which one group of laborers try to shaft the other group. They're competitors. I mean, immigration restrictions are precisely that. Immigration restrictions were put in by the AFL-CIO in 1924. It's likely to stop the flow of foreign workers coming in so the domestic worker wage rates can go up. And uh, it's a pure cutthroat situation, but of course it's done in the name of labor solidarity and all that stuff. But they don't say it. They don't, although in those days they were franker about it. They're much more frankly monopolistic and racist. In those days. We'll, we'll get, when we get to the labor market later on, of course, we'll go into that. <clears throat> now, of course, racism is not, is not considered respectable if they don't deal in those terms. That's basically what it is. Uh, <clears throat> so, um, well, another thing that happens is you see what, you see dramatic instances of this working. Uh, usually, in the old days, used to exempt a lot of uh, occupations from, from minimum wage law. Some of them are still exempt. Agricultural workers are often exempt. Restaurant workers are exempt. These are lowest paid jobs. You see, if they try to impose you know, $20 an hour restaurant, they wouldn't have any restaurants left. I mean, obviously, they couldn't do that. They had to do, be careful. Huh? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> they had to be very, yeah, <laughs> more of that, right? More automats. <laughs> they, so so um, they had to be very careful with that. But any time, in many cases, they extend it. In other words, uh, uh, about 20 years ago, they suddenly extended the minimum wage law to, to agriculture. They had been exempt before. And, and, the, and the southern cotton fields, it's so dramatic a change, even the New York Times realized, and even the reporters, regular reporters, say, hey, this is, this is what happened. They suddenly extended, in other words, there had been no minimum wage law applied to southern cotton. All of a sudden, it's applied to it. The, the price goes way, the wage rate goes way up. All of a sudden, 100,000 people are unemployed in the southern cotton fields. So it was a dramatic, obvious illustration of... of uh, the effect of a minimum wage law, but it usually happens much more gradually than that. It's not a sudden application. You know, you're not paying 30 cents an hour and suddenly have to pay $3 an hour. So it's not, but when you have a dramatic instance like that, it's always mass unemployment. And so then, then the people realize it. The same thing happened with, again, about 20 years ago, the North Carolina crab packing plant, which is usually exempt. And then they extended to the crab packing plant. There are a lot of uh, marginal crab packing plants in the, on the coast of North Carolina. See, the thing about North Carolina, it's a very strange state because there's no, there's no rivers. Usually there's, there's rivers in South Carolina and Georgia. There are rivers, big rivers going up, so there's big ports. In North Carolina, there's no real rivers. So it's, it's difficult to bring the crabs <coughs> from, from the coastline to the in interior. <coughs> it's high, high transportation costs. So what happens is there was no minimum wage in, in the whole area. Then suddenly it's applied just like that, bingo. The crab packing, and they're all thrown out of work. And with all the this massive disemployment, unemployment in the area, and plus bankruptcies of the firm, they just couldn't hack it. Uh, they had to pay these high costs. They couldn't transport the stuff anymore. And the whole thing is uh, so there was mass unemployment and mass bankruptcy. So in dramatic cases like that, you can see it. In most cases, it happens very gradually. As somebody said, he jack up the minimum wage law at ten cents an hour every two years. You don't see it. It's not as visible. <clears throat> uh, Another case like that was during the Depression, when the minimum wage law first came in, it was 40 cents an hour. Because it seems incredible now. We have to remember the, the dollar is now worth by one tenth of what it was then. So this is equivalent of like $4 an hour now, something like that, or $3.20 an hour. So this is about comparable, 40 cents an hour. When they imposed the 40 cents an hour rate, there were a lot of people making 30 cents an hour. This is incredible as it might seem now. For example, Mexican American crab, uh, clam diggers. Uh, in California, the whole group, the whole family would go out and dig clams. Mother, father, and six kids, they go out and dig clams. Each one would be getting 30 cents an hour. The whole family income was pretty good in that, you say, because they, they were clamming a lot. <laughs> when, they imposed, <laughs> when they imposed 40 cents an hour, the whole gang was thrown out of work. In other words, it was 
became uneconomic for the, for the employers and then to pay 40 cents an hour for, for clamming, clam digging, whatever you do, whatever you do for your clam. And there was massive unemployment among the clam people. Uh, I think Cannery Row, a John Steinbeck novel about the Depression uh, in Monterey, California, is essentially about the, the unemployment of the clam industry. Of course, he doesn't pinpoint the cause of it. He doesn't say it's a minimum wage law. Very few writers understand economics anyway. So, that's, but he talks about the devastating effects of this. So, so to say it happens dramatically like that, we suddenly impose something. Uh, and there could be a lot of people working, uh, a lot of quote illegal, a lot of retired people would like to would like to work part time at a, at a below the minimum wage. If they get above, the, the, the employer can't afford to pay the minimum wage for things like that, like I don't know, ladies' room attendant at the order at the Bigford, wherever it is. They can't afford it, uh, so it just doesn't get done. And uh, if, they, if the government allowed part-time uh, uh, work below minimum wage, everybody would benefit. The consumer would benefit, the employer would benefit, and the, and the worker would benefit. Instead of that, the government says, no, it's illegal, and it's the end of it. Uh, there's another it's a more sinister element here. Oh, this is a sinister element. Uh, what happens is, because there are regional differences in wage rates, uh, if you have a federal minimum wage, it acts like a protective tariff, for example. Uh, Uh, the North is, up until recently, but yes, the United States. <laughs> That's fixing it up. <laughs> it is sort of like that. The Northeast, up until recently, the Northeast was much more heavily industrialized than the South. It still is, actually, leaving out the Southwest here. So the Northeast, having more capital per worker, uh, means the wage rates are high. We'll get to the wage market, labor market later, but I mean, the point is, you can see right away, the demand curve for labor goes up in the north. This tends to increase wage rates. Uh, so it means that wage rates in the north tend to be higher than wage rates in the south. Particularly, of course, if, if prices, of course, of living is higher, in addition to that, real income is not that much higher, but there's often more inflation, say, in New York than there is in North Carolina. And so, in, in money terms, it's even a bigger difference. At any rate, so workers tend to migrate from the south to the north to take advantage of the higher wage rates. And capital tends to migrate from the north to the south to take advantage of the lower wage costs. The long-run tendencies are for equality. In other words, the long-run tendencies, very long-run, it's not like a day-to-day -day equilibrium. Long-run tendencies to equalize wage rates in the north and south. Okay? So <clears throat> this means that newer firms will tend to be, uh, in, the, tend to be uh, in the south, will tend to outcompete, especially inefficient industries here in the north. So, uh, in particular, you have industries in New York and New England like uh, uh, clothing manufacturing and printing and things like that, which are inefficient. If you see any printing plant or, or clothing plant in New, England, in New England, for example, they're all old, decaying factories, lousy equipment and all that. And the new plants in the South are, of course, brand new equipment. So, the tendency is then for, for, for bankruptcy, except in, in, you know, in the North, and to move the Northern firm, Northern capital, to move down to the South and employ Southern labor. So. The northern industrialists or northern firms and backward industries like textiles and, and clothing and printing would like to be able to have a protective tariff to keep out all cheap southern labor, so to speak, cheap uh, goods that are produced in the south, like, as they have a protective tariff on goods from Japan or, or Europe or whatever. They can't do it. It's unconstitutional even now, and the Constitution is almost a dead letter. It's unconstitutional to place a protective tariff on goods coming from the south of the Mason-Dixon line. So the federal minimum wage law is, in a, is a way to get around it, a way to have a hidden protective tariff. Because, in other words, if you have a, I'm talking about a federal law, not, not a state law. If you have a, this is a labor market, and uh, this is a wage rate, and uh, you impose a protective tariff. I mean, a minimum wage say here, whatever it is, three thirty-five or something. What you're doing, and most of these marginal workers will be southern workers, because the wage level in the south has to be lower than the north. So what you're doing is then you're imposing, the northern firms are imposing especially high costs on the southern firms and bankrupt, bankrupt, bankrupting them and causing unemployment, crippling their competition. So it's a way, it's like having a barrier on the Mason-Dixon line, preventing goods or making higher cost goods coming across from the north. Senator, former Senator Javits in the 1966 minimum wage fight in Congress, uh, when he was arguing for an increase in minimum wage, well, made that very point. He actually put it that way. He said, we're being outcompeted here in, the, in New York by you know, our firms are being outcompeted by cheaper southern labor. And we have to keep, we have to impose higher costs on southern firms. Really saying the same thing. Um, 
So this is one way of doing it. It's one way of a hidden protective tariff to try to shaft your competitors in other in southern states, <clears throat> of course, imposing unemployment on them and so on and so on. Um, so it's, it's, in other words, what you're doing is here the A of Oak CIO, in other words, the higher paid workers are imposing unemployment, they're crippling the, the, the competition of, of marginal workers, women, blacks, and teenagers, and also in particular northern firm industrialists and workers are imposing extra costs on southern firms and unemployment on southern workers. So it's, it's a combination of the two. Yeah? I would say no, it's a benefit for everybody except the, the higher paid uh, northern workers and the... What about I wouldn't say they'd be decreased. They'd certainly be decreased very little. Only those are directly competing with the, uh, with the uh, marginal workers. In other words, the same construction field, if, if marginal workers are, if there's a, if there's a um, minimum wage and some marginal workers are disemployed, they'll be competing with higher paid workers in that area. That doesn't mean all higher paid people. I mean, those are particularly in that area, in the areas they're competing with, right? And by the way, the AFL-CIO people make that argument. They say, well, the reason they're against they say the reason they're against a minimum, a lower minimum wage for teenagers, they say, yes, it will hurt some adult, un adult employment. Adult workers might have to suffer. Well, some of them might, but it'd be a very, very small amount, obviously. It was a direct competition with uh, marginal workers. Sure. Now, the, uh, the idea that everybody benefits is really just a long-run thing, where, where the, the whole economy benefits from, from, from economic freedom. But, uh, obviously, in, in specific situations, uh, monopolists benefit, and you know, people through their competitors' benefit. Just in the long run, very long run, they, they lose that too. But that's a, you know, it's a uh, more vaguer proposition. They, they might not care about the long run, but we care about it. <laughs> we, we live in the long run. <laughs> okay, give me an idea of the a striking example of, uh, I'll do that next time, we'll get a striking example of how, how black teenage unemployment was created, caused by increasing the minimum wage law. Okay, take a 10 minute break. Okay, we have a fascinating bit of statistics here. These are uh, male teenagers. It's also female. It works the same way. Uh, it's a similar. First of all, I want to uh, talk about unemployment rate. Um, huh? There's a there's a uh, important statistic. It's not. It's the so-called unemployment rate. Unemployment rate is defined as. <clears throat> Number of unemployed divided by the number of empl employed plus number of unemployed. Uh, now this uh, this the total of the number of employed plus number of unemployed is called the labor force. In other words, the population. Population in the United States is now something like 225 million. These are not all in the labor force, obviously. In other words, not all of these people are either working or seeking work. Um, quiet. Uh, if they're between the ages of zero and ten, presumably they're not, they're not in the labor force. If they're retired, they're not in the labor force for half of they could come back uh, with a attractive enough offer. Um, the old days, women were not in the labor force, now many of them are, and so forth and so on. So the number of people, number of population in the labor force fluctuates. Uh, I don't know how many there are now, I'll say 150 million. Probably less than that. 120 million or something. That's the labor force. Then the number of, so you have the number of employed divided by the number of employed plus unemployed. How do you define the number of people unemployed? They're defined by as those seeking work who can't find it. So this is a, uh, so this, uh, so if the uh, if this number, let's say, is 120 million, and if if uh, 12 million are unemployed, then it's, it's the total is ten, the unemployment rate is 10 percent. If six million are unemployed, then, then the total is is six uh, percent, uh, five percent. All right. So in other words, what you have is the number of unemployed divided by number of employed plus unemployed. Now, the unemployment rate, first of all, how do, you, how do you know who's unemployed? How do you find this out? Well, it's done by sampling techniques, usually by the Bureau of Department of Labor. <clears throat> and um, it's done by interviewing. The, the Department of Labor agents go around and interview people at random, random samples. 
And uh, they ask questions. Now, there's the, you define as unemployed. Of course, you know who's employed. It's fairly easy. Although, what do you do about part-time employment? It's also tricky. So those, the unemployment statistics are always in a very weak shape uh, for that reason. Uh, you ask them, um, are you unemployed right now? And they say, yes. Have you been seeking work? I think the definition, you have to have been unemployed and seeking work for four weeks. In other words, if you just if you just fired, let's say, a week ago, you're not considered unemployed. You have to be you have to be unemployed for a certain uh, length of time. And uh, are you been, have you been seeking work? Well, if you ask, if an interviewer asks somebody, have you been seeking work? I almost always say yes. I can say no. I'm I'm a bum. I'm sort of lying here, uh, you know, contemplating my navel for, for six months. <laughs> so you, you tend to have a higher degree of unemployment than actually exists. In other words, the people uh, will tend to answer, tell the interviewers what they think the interviewers would like to hear. <clears throat> And especially if they think an interviewer can somehow connect it with the rest of the government, with the IRS or whatever it is. So they, um, so there tends to be an inflation in the number of unemployed compared to those who are really not seeking work. If you're not seeking work, then you're considered not part of the labor force. You're sort of voluntarily retired or something. So on the one hand, the unemployment, the official statistics over overweight, overestimate the number of uh, amount of unemployment of those who are seeking work. On the other hand, they also underestimate. There are also people who really have been seeking work and get too discouraged. They haven't been able to find a, a job for six months and they sort of quit. They're not really, they're still really part of the labor force and they're not counted as unemployed. So you have two things going in the opposite direction. On the one hand, you overestimate the amount of unemployment because you overestimate the amount of pe people who are really seeking work, not, sort of, not just sort of lazy. On the other hand, you underestimate the so-called discouraged workers who would be actively seeking work if they really thought they could find something. How do you figure out? There's no really way to scientifically decide between these two things. Uh, usually liberals claim that there's an underestimate of unemployment, and conservatives claim there's an overestimate. It can work either way, as far as I can say. <clears throat> um, the, um, another problem is un unemployed seeking work at what level? <clears throat> and usually the way, for example, the, the unemployment insurance is, is given uh, to people who are seeking work who will uh, have to accept jobs that are offered to them by, un by the unemployment of the employment bureau. Uh, which is supposed to be comparable jobs to what they to what they had quit. Uh, now, the, the pro there are many problems with this com comparable employment. Supposing you're you're working as a uh, in the calculating machine business, the old calculating machines before calculators came in. Obviously, there's no jobs now in calculating machines. Supposing you say I'm I insist on a job which is in the calculating machine. That's what I know, and that's the heck with it. I refuse to retrain to other things. Uh, there is no comparable work for me. In that case. Supposedly, you can get unemployment insurance for the rest of your life. Obviously, it doesn't work that way. But the question then is, what is comparable? In other words, what's a comparable job? <clears throat> um, should you insist on the same pay? Usually, and that's another thing, usually you, if the, you're considered unemployed. You don't have to take a job and, and, and not get unemployment insurance uh, if the job is a lower pay than when you have. Well, why should you always have the same pay? I mean, what, what is there that guarantees forever? You always have the same job, same amount of pay forever. If you have to shift, for example, from calculating machines, which are now obsolete, to calculators, you might be, you might have to have a lower, you know, apprentice job. You might not know about calculators. You might have to first start as a lower level pay. It seems to me to get a, to be called, to be called unemployed, unquote, quote, unquote, uh, you're really not if you refuse to take a job which is, uh, which is offered to you, which is in the, you know, uh, like the new calculator business. So there's a whole question here about what kind of job you have to take to be considered, um, what kind of job can you refuse and still be called unemployed? Again, it's a, it's a subjective estimate. Um, so you have to take any job whatsoever uh, and still be and, and, and then be considered unemployed if you don't take it, uh, or what? Uh, again, it's a very elastic situation. Uh, there used to be a cartoon comic strip called Little Abner, where the uh, there was a guy in Dog Patch, which is a mythical town in, somewhere in the Ozarks, and this guy had never worked at all. I mean, he was sort of lying around all the time in Dog Patch under a tree, and Little Abner says. Uh, you're a bum. Why don't you want to work? You're never, never going to work. No, no. He says, I want to work. Says, but I, there's only a few jobs I will insist on keeping. Anything else is not my, I'm not, uh, refuse to take. And for example, he says, I'm holding out for president of Harvard. I'll take no, no job less than president of Harvard. But since he'd never been to high school, much less college, the chance of him getting it was small at best. So, uh, the question is, is he then unemployed or is he, uh, is he still, is still in the labor force or not? Obviously, obviously he isn't. And some elastic definitions you could say he was. <clears throat> he's just holding out for a, for a job she thinks he's qualified for, namely president of Harvard or professor of nuclear physics or Caltech or whatever. So obviously, uh, 
And some definitions you can get, you can pull yourself, call yourself unemployed and get unemployment insurance forever because you can say, well, I'm, I wouldn't work for way except I'm, I insist on being head of IBM or whatever. So uh, obviously these people are not really unemployed in any, in any correct sense. <clears throat> okay, anyway, you establish some kind of un unemployment rate. <clears throat> and uh, the main thing that, that is once it's established, regardless of what the definition is, is to stick to it consistently. So you can, if the rate goes up or down considerably, you can say, well, it does mean something, even though the the actual definition might be pretty shaky. If you, if you stick to the same definition as a doubling or a cutting in half of the rate, it does mean it's something important. Okay, so usually, in the old days, full employment meant uh, an unemployment rate of between 2 and 3 percent. It can't be zero. For one thing, people move around. I mean, people quit one job and move and, and go somewhere else. Or well, they move from New York to California, from Illinois to Texas or something, and the process of moving, they're obviously unemployed for a few weeks or six weeks or whatever. So this is called frictional unemployment, and uh, it's a question of mobility. In, uh, in the old days, in uh, England, for example, people mostly don't move at all. They stay in the same little county all their life. The full employment rate was like 1% or even a little bit less. I think in Switzerland, the unemployment rate is almost zero. Uh, but in, in the United States, it was considered classically about 2 to 3% as, as the fine of so-called full employment. Uh, during recessions, uh, unemployment would go up to about 6%. And uh, during a major, a major depression, it would be up to 10 And during the, the, the mighty 1929-1930s depression, it was 25%, 20 to 25 That That gives you some kind of range of what the unemployment rate means. Okay. Uh, otherwise, it would be a meaningless number. Uh, right now, the f unemployment is going up. This is a macro theme, so I'm not going to go into this in any depth. But the uh, full employment has been redefined. As unemployment is much more heavy heavier now than it was saying. In the 1950s, unemployment was around 2 to 3% most of the time. Okay. Uh, now, the, it's minimum 6%. And it goes up to about 8 so on a full employment has been redefined as to be about 5-6%, just like that. One way of achieving full employment is to redefine it. <laughs> just call it full employment. Hey, this is great, we're still in full employment. Just leave up the, the definition. So uh, recession rates are now about 9, 10, 9 and 11%. There is no depression anymore because we outlaw the term depression. It's never used. You have a mild recession and a severe recession. So during the last recession, 1981-83, for example, unemployment rate was about 11%. It's now down to about 8. It's considered, or 7, I guess, at this point. We now define as being full employment. Okay, so this is, so this gives you an idea of, of what's going on, more as, as far as the numbers go. Okay, now we come to this, our statistic. Um, teenage unemployment has always been higher for obvious reasons, teenagers go, go, go in and out of the labor market pretty quickly, so they, uh, they bear the major burden of mobility, so to speak. So in 1948, we have uh, this is male teenage unemployment rate. Uh, the white rate white and black unemployment rate. The white rate was 8%, the black rate was 8%. And the interesting thing about this is that, and the adult rate was something like 3%, something like that, that there was now a, a myth in the United States that there's, a, there's sort of an automatic white-black unemployment gap, as it's called. In other words, the blacks always have three times the unemployment rate as whites. It wasn't true in 1948. Uh, there's no can't the, the, the difference can't be due to discrimination because there's probably less discrimination now than there was in 1948. Uh, so what's happening here? What's, what's obviously something screwy here to say this is kind of part of a structural thing in American economy since it didn't exist in 1948. Um, in 1949, the federal minimum wage went up from 40 cents an hour to 75 cents an hour. And what you have, this is the federal minimum wage. And uh, it was 40 cents an hour from the 30s on until 1949. And of course, as inflation proceeded, the 40 cents meant less and less, obviously. In other words, the tendency is with inflation. This is a minimum wage law, wage rate, quantity. Uh, you disemploy a whole bunch of people. If, the, if, the, if there's inflation, the man curves go up a little inflation, tend to 
wipe out unemployment, as somebody said here, the minimum wage rate becomes uneffect ineffective. Because right now, for example, if there's a minimum wage rate of 40 cents an hour, it have no effect. It does not mean it's saying when the free market wage rate is going way up, especially with inflation. So 1949 it goes up to 75 cents an hour from 40. And uh, immediately the white unemployment teenage rate goes up to 11%, which is recession level. Okay? And, then, and the black rate goes up to 14%. The beginning, the first sign of the gap, the famous black-white unemployment gap, was the jacking up of the minimum wage law. <clears throat> it happened in, the, in, a, in a few months. Then comes the Korean War boom, as inflationary boom, and the, uh, from 1950... 51 to 53, and the, the gap disappears. In other words, the unemployment rate goes down, back to, to about 8, 7, 8, around that. Virtually disappears. In other words, essentially, the unemployment rate goes back down to the pre-Korean War boom, the pre-1948 level. Well, the Korean War is over in 1953, and the normality begins to assert itself, and the gap pops up again. In other words, 1954, 55, the white rate is up to 10, and the black rate is up to 13. <coughs> Now, the adult rates are lower, of course, for, but the, the major gap appears in the teenage. So again, the gap pops up again, again for the, uh, reappearing, it appeared for the first time in 1949. Uh, in 1956, the federal government jacks up the wage rate once more, this time to a dollar an hour. And uh, immediately, again within a six-month period or so, let's see, let's see what happens here. The white rate goes up to 13%, the black rate goes up to 24%. This is 1929 depression levels. In other words, 1929 depression, the, the maximum unemployment rate o overall, the whole economy is 25%. So it's considered catastrophic. The black unemployment rate then goes up. The first time, black teenager unemployment rate goes up to 24%. And it keeps going up. By the way, this is the beginning of the big gap, the doubling situation. Uh, starts with the 1956 minimum wage law. In 1958, and then what happens almost diabolical. What happens after that, uh, the... Uh, the rate begins to fall. The black unemployment rate falls to about 22%, and they jack up the minimum wage to $1.15 an hour, and it goes back up to 24 It keeps happening like that. Every time a teenager unemployment rate falls, the black rate falls a little bit, they jack up the minimum wage rule by another 10 cents, and it goes back up again. It's, almost, it's, it's amazing to chart it. By 1966, uh, it was still about 24%, and the big Discussion is should they increase the minimum wage now to dollar sixty an hour? It's been up, been going up to about dollar twenty-five. Should it go up to dollar sixty? This is nineteen sixty-six. And uh, various free market economists testified before Congress. They said, look, you uh, if you increase the minimum wage to dollar sixty, black unemployment rate will go up. Teenage black unemployment rate will go, will go up to thirty-three percent. They said you're crazy. It has nothing to do with it. It's structural. It has nothing to do with the minimum wage law. Sure enough, of course, they passed it. And sure enough, in, a, in a six months or a year, going up to 34%. And it's remained even higher from then on. In other words, the whole story from then on is a repeat of this story. The black unemployment rate now varies. Teenage rates is between 50 and 60% uh, in most, most areas. And of course, this is, um, this is super catastrophic. I mean, it's worse, much worse than the 1929 depression levels in the, in the, in for black, in the black areas. And um, it seems pretty obvious what the salute, what the Cause of the problem is what the solution is, even though li liberals are to acknowledge it. Even even just to cut the minimum wage by to teenagers by ten cents an hour or something. Yeah. What is it now? Uh, I mean, right now it's about. Uh, I'm not sure. It's about eighteen or something like that. Yeah, something like that. Um, so. Um, at any rate, this, this, the, it's obvious what the. This causes tremendous social problems, to say the least, and and, uh, and it seems to be obvious what the solution is. And it's not it's not war on poverty or increase in poverty bureaucracy, which is what a war on poverty usually amounts to. The Johnson War on Poverty, um, the famous joke is, which was of course correct, is the only poverty that was relieved by the war on poverty was the poverty of the, of the social workers who were running the program. They were they were in great shape. They were getting hefty hefty salaries, <laughs> which is usually what happens. Um, these things. So, um, anyway, this is uh, again an idea. And one way to look at it: see, nobody is guaranteed a job if, the, if, it, if, you, if you outlaw working below three dollars thirty-five cents an hour. Nobody says you're going to get a job at three thirty-five. Just you can't get a job for less than that. That's the only thing that the government says. 
thou shalt not get a job for less than 335 an hour, and that's it. Um, and so uh, you can see the result of that should be pretty clear. Um, and once again, the the, uh, the, rate is, the minimum wage was not pushed up high enough to really just to, to start disemploying union worker with seniority. Yeah. Oh, they all now. The economists now all say the same thing. I'm, this, I, I used to be in a small minority, I'm, and now this is, I would say, the majority of economists. It's just a famous politically uh, impossible to put this across. The union, the Reagan administration committed to a lot of unions, especially Teamsters Union, a much beloved, <laughs> much beloved union, uh, <laughs> uh, and even more gangster-ridden than most other unions. And so uh, the, um, so they can't. They just feel like politically they can't do it. See, but the problem you have now is, see, I used, when I was teaching this stuff 20 years ago in, in classes, students would say, uh, if you're so right, how come nobody else agrees with you? Well, now this is no longer a question. Most economists will agree with all this, everything, almost everything I've been saying here. Just as then they say, well, politically, you can't be put through. The, the press won't like it. Unions won't like it. Whatever. And so the, the cities won't like it. The farmers won't like it. And just they haven't got the guts to try to change it politically. But among economists, it's pretty well accepted. Uh, so I, I suppose that's a hopeful sign, <laughs> right? Yeah. Is there an increase in the minimum wage after the Korean War? After the Korean War. Uh, yeah, well, 56, sorry. Uh, 1956, it went up to a uh, dollar an hour. That was a few years after, three years after the Korean War. It was over. That, that caused all the, the whole problem here with the 20, 24% uh, black unemployment. Right after the Korean War, Korean War, there was no increase. In other words, what happened after, right afterwards, it just went back to the 49 level. Like, things went back to the 1949 level. It was post-75 cents an hour and pre, and then a, and after the Korean War boom is you know, going away, and so you're back to sort of normal, you know, pre-boom normal. And then when we go back to here, then the, then the 56 minimum wage law gets a big increase. This, this creates the whole 24% thing. 